ಭಾವಿರಾವೀರ್ಮಗೇಧಿ ರುದ್ರಯತ್ತೆ ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಮುಖಂ ತೇನ ಮಾಂ ಪಾಹಿ ನಿತ್ಯ ಮೇ ದ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಲೀಡರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಅನ್ರಿಯಲ್ ಟು ದ ರಿಯಲ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡಾರ್ಕ್ನೆಸ್ ಟು ಲೈಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡೆತ್ ಟು ಎ ಮೋರ್ಟಾಲಿಟಿ ಮೇ ದ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಫಿಲ್ ಅವರ್ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಸಮ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಬಿ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೊ today in this evening and then tomorrow two talks in the three talks we'll try to take a brief look at the chapter 12 of the gita um which deals with uh, bhakti yoga clearly there is not enough time to analyze every verse but we'll try to uh, get a broad overview of the chapter to at least get an idea about the important points that get discussed in it among among the hindu texts <coughs> probably the gita is the most uh, well known on the other hand if it's not the most philosophically it's not the most central texts in the sense that as most of you are aware um, there are lots and lots of books in the hindu tradition and sometimes it's difficult to know which is the book i need to study which is the most essential and which are the non essentials so bro- it's helpful to see that broadly uh, hindu scriptures are divided into two groups one group is called a shruti and the other is called smriti and to the shruti belong the vedas shruti literally mean that which is heard and smriti literally mean that which is remembered so shruti only the vedas and vedas include among the four ways generally the vedic literature gets divided uh, the first part of the vedas <coughs> as called samhitas the second part is called brahmanas the third part is the the aranyakas and the fourth part is the upanishad and so this vast vedic literature um at some point in history was classified into <coughs> I'm sorry about this <coughs> at some point in history this vast literature was divided into four books and that's how we nowadays speak about the vedas in the plural but they were not like four books written by anyone in fact the vedas are called a purusheya there is no human authorship for generations together they were passed down orally and, and only at some point they were written down now one question that can obviously come is when we know when things are passed orally then they are easy to get easy to for them to change <coughs> so how can we be sure about the validity of what has come down to us today as the vedas being the whatever was revealed to the sages since for generations it was not even put down on paper and one thing that really helped was this strong faith that it's the sound of the vedas that had the power in it that even if one syllable were changed then it wouldn't have the intended effect so some of this faith embedded right from the beginning that it is not simply sometimes we say oh it's ideas that matter it doesn't matter how you express them and that's true in many ways but that was not how the vedic wisdom was seen they said yeah of course the ideas but even the words in which through which those ideas were expressed and <clears throat> every syllable of how that word was uttered so it was and sometimes they went to the extent of saying even if you don't understand the meaning if you pronounce it correctly with the correct intonations it will have the desired effect now we can debate about whether, whether how 
justified or unjustified that way of thinking is. But what that way of thinking did was they were very careful when it was passed from one generation to the next to keep the to be to 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 keep the everything as accurate as possible because they knew even if a little so there was no editing possible of the Vedic text nobody could say ah this doesn't sound good let me change it it wasn't, wasn't possible so that is how we can be sure that even though it was passed on orally that it has remained unchanged and of course when things are put down on paper they, they still can undergo revision but but the chances become less but the, the danger is more but it is simply verbal then a second class of literature came historically <coughs> um, which then we classify variously as Puranas, the Dharma Shastras and so on now all of these other texts that have come afterwards uh, they, we, it's possible to know as much as possible about, about that it has some kind of a human authorship even though we may not know much in detail about every author at least there is an attribution of those texts to some human author so the Shruti Smriti distinction has to be kept in mind now technically the Gita is not a part of the Vedas it, it is actually as we know a part of the Mahabharata which is an epic some people can see it as history again it can get classified according to the belief systems of different people and yet Gita has become you know, almost a central and popular text of the Hindu tradition the credit for that goes largely to Shankaracharya because Gita is a mere 700 verses you know close to 100,000 verses of the Mahabharata so it's just a small drop in this big ocean of Mahabharata and we are not aware of any commentary on the Gita before Shankaracharya wrote it uh, if there was then it's lost but we are not aware of anything and so therefore it's Shankaracharya who is given the credit for noticing this real gem that is that was there in the Mahabharata and kind of lift it out and then draw our attention to it and then after Shankara and most of the Acharyas who came afterwards it almost became an incumbent upon them that if you have to be recognized as a an orthodox belonging to the orthodoxy of the tradition you will have to say something about the Gita You'll, you don't have to always agree with Shankara but you will have to say something about it and therefore we have so many commentaries on it in fact the centrality of Shankaracharya is to some extent because every great Acharya who came after him they either had to agree with him or disagree with him they couldn't just ignore him they couldn't <laughs> pretend that he didn't exist um, and so that's why Swami Vivekananda said that the Gita is the best summary of the Vedantic wisdom of the best summary of the Upanishads which is what makes them makes Gita very authentic but still uh, so here, here is the question why is the Gita authentic and most of us might say well Krishna himself <coughs> taught it so that makes it the most authentic text which is true but then the, if you start nitpicking into it a lot of questions can come first of all the, the, the context of the Gita itself so it's there in the battlefield we know we are aware of this. thousands of soldiers on either side the, the punches are blown and then, and then this dialogue starts now no matter how fast Krishna might have spoken it's still at least an hour, hour and a half that seems so um, impractical so the soldiers are just waiting like when this lecture end again it's also who was noting it down there wasn't anyone nearby and so are the words attributed to Krishna in the Gita really the words that Krishna spoke I mean, we don't even know whether they spoke in Sanskrit language I mean, we don't know a lot 
In one of the ways it could be understood is that it's possible that Arjuna had this dilemma and in in his own words and in whatever language they spoke he probably told Krishna now I don't think I'm going to fight and then perhaps Krishna spoke with him a few words <coughs> but the greatest of teachers and Krishna was of course Avatar himself they have the ability to convey highest wisdom <coughs> It may be a few words. Sometimes even words are not necessary. Just to look is enough. We see that in the life of Ramakrishna. Oftentimes there will be some debate going on between the disciples and he will just come and say, Oh, ki hoche, ki hoche, what is going on? And then maybe just kind of just pat someone on the back or just kind of just touch them and the whole thing will change. So some, these greatest teachers can convey that teaching through a touch, through a look, or maybe just a few words. So that is one possibility that Arjuna said, I'm not going to fight, oh my own people are there on the other side and, and then maybe Krishna spoke a few words <clears throat> and then Arjuna said, okay, now my problem is solved and then he fought. Maybe it may take a few minutes or a couple of minutes. Now does, we must be grateful to Vyasa, whose actually birthday we celebrated a few days ago, the, the day we celebrate as the Guru Purnima is actually the birthday of Vyasa, um, that he then, that insight which Krishna imparted to Arjuna within those few minutes or with those few words. He then <coughs> put that insight into this 700 verses that now we, we can call it the Bhagavad Gita. So we don't have to be very fanatical about it like this is exactly the word that Krishna spoke and this is exactly, he spoke it in like 18 chapters. <coughs> All of that occurred later on, the division of chapters and how it occurred. So, um, the, what makes the Gita authentic is not really that Krishna taught it, but that it is in complete harmony with the Upanishads. I was discussing it with one Vedanta Pandit in Chennai many years ago. And he said, when we were discussing the Shruti Spiriti division, so he said that if the Gita were to say something, that contradicted the Upanishads, then we would reject the Gita. It doesn't matter whether Krishna taught it or who taught it. Because the Vedas are the Supreme Court. And that Supreme Court is completely impartial. So there is no, no partiality there. And so whatever the Gita said, because there is no human authorship, there is no human connection to that one. And so because the Gita is in complete harmony, with the Upanishad, that's why it is authentic. And it makes, what has made it powerful, that it was taught by one who actually lived what was taught. And that's what makes teaching powerful. So if there's anything we don't understand in the Gita, we don't necessarily immediately have to go to any commentaries. We just have to look at the life of Krishna. Because the greatest of teachers, their life itself is the commentary of their teaching. And th which is ma what makes Gita so special. Um, it's like, um, <coughs> I remember uh, some years ago, uh, I'd gone to, to Milwaukee, I think. And then there was a, 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 a seminar dealing with, with the harmony of religions and, and the parliament of religions and so on. And um, so when I had to give the keynote address there, and so we spoke about the first five words that Swami Vivekananda spoke. And he said, sisters and brothers of America and how, what an amazing uh, reception we got. And people were, uh, we, we read about it, this thing. And so, so I mentioned that. And then I said, sisters and brothers of Milwaukee. <laughs> and it was like total silence. <laughs> and I said, see, I told you. <clears throat> then I mentioned this and then they just kind of a consolation prize, they all got up and they all did this thing. <laughs> but but I, I say this because when Swami Vivekananda said, sisters and brothers, it were not just the words that were coming. He actually saw everyone as sisters and brothers. So when you say something as a result of a direct experience, those words become more powerful. And that's true not only with regard to these higher teachings, with regard to even our day-to-day -day conversations. So when we speak, 
It could be a most secular talk, it could be any talk. But if that talk, every word that I speak will be truly authentic and will be powerful if it is an expression of who I am. Otherwise, one can read in a book and then just kind of just go and vomit it out. And even if, the, if you have a good way of uh, delivering and you have a good memory, you might be able to impress your friends in your conversation. But that wouldn't make those words powerful or authentic. So even in our daily life, for a, for a spiritual life, first we need to lead an authentic life. So what we speak, what we do, should be an expression of who we are. Because a lot of the stress and, and and difficulties that people experience in life is because the inner me and the outer me there is a gap because the world can see only externally who I am only I know what is going on inside my head and so we don't pay as much attention to what is going on inside there is we pay so much attention on how I come across to other people I mean, think about think about um, at home. At home, the way we the way the care we might take in uh, keeping our sitting room or the visitors' room, whenever any guests come, where we invite <coughs> people in, generally we pay more attention to that than your basement or your garage, <laughs> because like well. Who is going to go there? So you don't need to see. <laughs> but your basement and garage is as much a part of your home yeah. as the room is. And so that's a little bit of thing. So our basement and garage is like what is going on inside us. And we say, oh, I can take care of it later on. And just like we postpone clearing our garage and basement, we can take care of it later on. And years and years could pass. Same thing can happen with inside also. So nobody can see what's going on inside me. I can take care of it later on. Let me make sure that my external, the way I speak, the way I dress, the way I greet people. So, so first thing as spiritual seekers, to be a bhakta, this is the bhakti yoga that we are studying, is not so simply about oh, just uh, doing japa and meditation and praying. Now, that's important. But, but it's first of all, making the inner person and outer person one. That's what transparency means. That's what Ramakrishna meant. There is a saying in Bengali, Mon Muk Ak Kora, literally means making the speech and the mind one. In effect, what it means is what we think, what we say, and what we do, they must be in harmony. And a lot of times, our mind thinks in one way, we say something else, and in real life, we do yet something else. So these three ways, the three directions of the thoughts, words and actions go. And of course, if you are being pulled in three different directions, you are going to feel the stress. And so we have to make an effort. If we want to be true bhaktas, true devotees, and to make our life authentic, that my thoughts, my words and my actions must be in harmony. And we see that in the life of Krishna. Is all the three were in complete harmony. That's why it's such a great ideal. And of course, as a personality, he is the most loving, most joyful personality we could see uh, in in our tradition. Interestingly enough, in the Gita, Krishna in one place, in fact two places at least, he speaks about the world. He said, Anityam Asukham Lokam Imam Prapya Bajaswamam having come <coughs> to this Anitya, the temporary, transient world, a sukham, joyless world, Bajaswamam, worship me alone. <coughs> Several important things here. One is mm, me, worship me alone. So that we see Krishna often uses this first person pronoun, I, worship me, surrender to me. So then the question is, who, who is, who is this me that Krishna is referring to? <coughs> <coughs> when
when you and I we use the word I or me who are we referring to now Krishna devotees or if you read some ISKCON version of the of the Gita they would say well <coughs> Krishna says worship me surrender to me so that means surrender to Krishna Krishna alone is the truth because Krishna himself had declared it and we say well that's what exactly what the Gita says but if we just pause and say when I use the word I or me who am I referring to and usually it's a package it's like well when I say I or me well it's with this the body and I know I'm not simply the body my mind my ego my thoughts and then if there is something beyond that the spirit all of these three taken together that's my me right now so when I say I am sitting here <coughs> lit really what is sitting here is this body so when I say I am sitting here what I am really saying is this is me so when Krishna says worship me or surrender me is he also meaning that Krishna's body which was born the child was born to Vasudeva and Devaki is that whom do we need to surrender to And the problem with that thinking is that <coughs> if we have to, if Krishna, when Krishna says I or me and thinks about his body and mind and ego and everything and I, when I say I or me, I think of my body and mind and ego, then what is the difference between us? What makes Krishna different or special and me not so special? And the answer is that when Krishna says I, he is not referring to this perishable, transient things which then get discarded in the Upanishadic discussion of as koshas, the coverings. So when Krishna says I, he is referring to the real I, the Atma. And so of course when Krishna said worship me, worship the Atman, surrender to the Atman, surrender to the truth, surrender to the spirit, it makes complete sense. And so I can become Krishna-like. What Krishna wants every one of us to do is to look deeply in our own eye and says, are you, is this I simply this body or mind or something more than that? So that's the first thing to remember when we study the Gita. Every time you see Krishna saying I, <coughs> that I is not the historical Krishna. That's this transcendent aspect of Krishna. Krishna who is eternal. And this, this is true about with all great ones. <coughs> When, when Jesus said, I am the light, I am the, I'm the truth, I am the way, right? I am life, truth. So again, and this can seem as a very, you can either say, well, he is the only savior because he himself said, I am this thing. Or you could say, when Jesus used the word I, what kind of I Jesus was referring to? Then you will come to the same conclusion. At least from a Vedantic perspective, Krishna was... Jesus was referring to the spirit and of course the spirit is the way, that is the light, that is the way. Who can deny, who can, who can uh, argue with that? Same thing with regard to Ramakrishna, with all of these great ones, Buddha, all of them. <coughs> so that is the first thing. Whenever you see them saying I, um, make sure that are they referring to the historical dimension or the, or the transcendent dimension. These dimensions can exist even, even to non-historical characters. Now, now in, when you speak about some of these non-historical, well, history as we understand it, um, aspects of divinity. Now, Ganesha. Now, we know in the Hindu pantheon, Ganesha is the son of Shiva. Shiva's son is Ganesha. And we also have stories about how Ganesha was born. We know all of that. Now, in, um, in many texts, I mean, particularly say in Tursi Rasa's Ramayana, <coughs> so in the very beginning, when he's describing uh, Shiva's marriage, and so in Shiva marriage, uh, Tursi Rasa said the first deity that Shiva worships is Ganesha. That <laughs> doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, he is Shiva's son. <laughs> so, how could he be now? Exactly the same way, Ganesha also has 
a transcendent dimension. And that Ganesha is birthless and deathless. He is eternal. He was there even before Shiva. But this Ganesha also has this other dimension in which then of course is part of the Shiva family and so on. So we see this. It's good to recognize these nuances when we study these texts. <coughs> <coughs> so going back to that anityam asukham lokam imam prapya bhajasva maam so worship me mean worship that truth now having come to this asukham transient yes we understand everything is changing all the time but what does Krishna mean by saying coming to the joyless world and I said Krishna is the most joyful happy personality it's a most adorable personality and he's saying it's a joyless world. In the Gita, in one other place, Krishna uses the term Dukhalayam Ashashvatam, just like Himalaya, an abode of snow, Dukhalaya, an abode of sorrow. So, why would Krishna, <coughs> a realistic way, would we say, oh, this world, as we all experience, there is joy and there is sorrow? Krishna could have said, oh, this world of joy and sorrow. No, he didn't say that. He said, joyless world, a, a board of pain and a board of suffering. Now this might seem like a very pessimistic negative view of life. Uh, we see that with regard to Buddha also. Buddha just spoke about that suffering. Like, wait a minute, aren't there then any happiness? No, there is just suffering. So again, <coughs> joy and suffering can also be seen at two levels. So there is this suffering which we are aware of, the daily ups and downs that we have with the physical, mental, emotional level. Uh, there is the suffering caused by hunger, homelessness. There is the suffering caused by betrayal. So we, we know, we are familiar with these kind of suffering. Uh, there is the suffering of hun through hunger. Um, all these are very real forms and there are many people suffering uh, by, through these, uh, in these ways. But we know that these kinds of suffering are not universal in the sense that we cannot say that every person in the world is homeless, or every person is hungry. Yeah, there are hungry people, there are homeless people, but there are other people who, who don't have the problem of hunger, who don't have the problem of homelessness. So in that sense, this problem doesn't affect every living creature. <coughs> But there are certain other kinds of problems which affect everyone, no exceptions. And those are what Krishna says in the Gita. He says, Janma Mrityu Jara Vyadhi Dukkha. <coughs> That's exactly the word he uses, Dukkha. So when he says Dukkhalayan, the Dukkha that Krishna is referring to is a Dukkha related to Janma Mrityu, birth and death, that our life is sandwiched between birth at one side and death at the other. And both are really painful. Um, we know we, we speak all we speak about labor pain. So there is pain involved in the birth. Uh, the first thing that the child does after being born is cry. Of course, everyone celebrates at the birth of a baby, but the baby itself is crying. In fact, immediately after birth, if the baby doesn't cry, that's a problem. In fact, if you make sure that, in fact, oftentimes in, in stories and in movies, that's kind of a, everyone's waiting and you can see very dramatized and as soon as they hear the cry of the baby, then it's all celebration. But I mean, think about it, that we equate life with crying, like when the baby cries, means, oh, okay, everything is fine. That's exactly what the life is. And then, of course, through the rest of the life, we have plenty of opportunities to cry even more. <laughs> the, so life being sandwiched between birth and death, this limitation, and even though we may not always speak about death, this unspoken, unconscious anxiety related to death, often used uh, in Patanjali Yoga Sutra, they use the word abhinivesha. That's always there. Um, that, that uh, we don't, we try to escape, there is a kind of an auto escape mechanism within us, 
any thought of death or idea of death even if the mind dwells on it for a while especially if there is someone near near someone near to us passes away for a while the mind kind of becomes a little disturbed but then after a while uh, there is some mechanism within which says well life has to go on and life goes on and it's not just about anyone avatars have come and died the great people have come and died but the life still goes on in the gospel of ramakrishna towards the end m uh, master mahashe uh, who, who recorded the gospel in one place he says he says that um, he said i used to think that when thakur was alive uh, that time i used to think oh life would be impossible without him i would what's the point in living without him if he goes all charm will go out of life and and then of course by that time thakur's mahasabar is already taken place this occurs somewhere in the end and he says but now he is gone i am still living everything seems to be going just fine and so that is no this is not to kind of this is not a criticism of anybody this is just the way life is that even when these great saints and avatars go still life still moves on so this sandwiching of life between janma and mrityu is a cause of pain is a cause of sorrow sometimes visible often times invisible and then of course jara aging the process of aging we know as we age um, physical mental uh, vitality start decreasing and and problems start we can pretend we are not aging we can hide our age but we cannot stop the process itself uh, and of course jara and they often say no matter how much organic food you eat how much exercise you take no one can say that i have never fallen ill or will never fall ill so this is a defective product the body is a defective product <laughs> normally if any defective product is released in the market we want it to be recalled <laughs> but this is one defective product is there now we will manage with it don't recall <laughs> so now that is the kind of a dukha krishna is referring to when he refers to the world as dukhalayam ashashvata but most of the time most of the people are so busy dealing with the superficial dukkhas of daily life and and somehow trying to forget them in the superficial joys of daily life that most don't even have the time or intention or interest in digging deeper and discovering this deeper dukkha now we could say that this dukkha the deeper dukkha is existential not not connected with that existential philosophy or anything but more in a literal sense of the term in other words this dukkha is directly connected with our existence as human beings as living beings as long as i am a living being i am going to be affected by this birth death aging sickness and of course the limitations of the mind and so on and therefore this is connected with my very existence as human being so the only way out is to stop being a human being <laughs> stop being a living being now death is no solution because death really doesn't do anything death simply takes this outermost layer of the body goes and you get a new one which is kind of nice a new body except that the mind is the same and that's not fun either when suppose suppose someone says every day um or every year or every 10 years i will give a new body to your car but the engine is going to remain same then of course we are going to take greater care of the engine because engine is something you won't get another engine but you know you can get a different so so that is no solution because the the mind remains the same and therefore <coughs> from a vedantic perspective stopping to not be a human being means to be our own true selves because in reality we are divine and if i remember i am divine then i go back to that real i the i of krishna the i of jesus the i of buddha but my i now is buried 
under these layers of the body and mind. And that is why this divine me now is covered by the human me. And it's the human me that is suffering. As long as I'm a human being, I have to suffer. That's it. The only way out of suffering is don't be a human being. Now, we could say that in a 24-hour cycle, for a few minutes, we are not really human beings. When we sleep in that state of sushupti, when you are fast asleep, when you are not even dreaming, you are not a human being at that time. Because what makes a human being a human being? What, what makes me think I am a human being? Because of course I have a human body, that's it. Mm, what We don't know what makes a dog think he is a dog or a cat thinks he is a cat. But one would, if, if nature is built on the same plan, it might seem like, well, if the dog refuses to say I am a dog, then the dog is no longer a dog. If I say I am not a human being, I am a divine being, I can become divine. And in deep sleep, I don't have this ego that I am a human being. So, and it's not something we do a lot of tapas, well nowadays even to get deep sleep some tapas say <laughs> necessary. <laughs> but at least it's a part of a kind of a biological process that um, we at least get a few minutes of really deep sleep. Now, some waking experience can be sometimes painful or mixed. Dreams could be sometimes nightmares. But the deep sleep is always a joyful experience. No one can say, I slept very deeply, which was extremely painful. It never happens. <laughs> because in deep sleep, there is neither the body nor the mind. So that's why I said in a deep sleep state, we could almost say that we are not human beings. We don't have any awareness of human being. And we know from our own experience, those few minutes every night, when I don't have this awareness that I am a body or mind, that this is me, I am the happiest being present in this entire creation. In fact, there is no creation either in deep sleep. I, I am, I am all. In fact, if there is nothing other than me, even the I is not there. Well, everything is just one. And that is the Dukkha Krishna was referring to. So, coming back to this, um, now you might say, what has all this got to do with Bhakti Yoga? I think this is necessary because one of the things that students of the Gita and students of Swami Vivekananda's life have to, to, to keep in mind is that we cannot dissect the teachings of the Gita or dissect some of the books of Vivekananda as, as four separate things. And because Swami Vivekananda, there are four yogas, that's such a famous set of textbooks. And the Gita, the 18 chapters, and of course now we are going to study the 12th chapter, and 12th chapter is the is Bhakti Yoga, and then 13th chapter, 14th chapter. So it's good to study this, the Gita, as different <coughs> chapters. But to understand the Gita, we need to have a, a holistic picture in our mind. <coughs> the, it's not that Bhakti Yoga is just one chunk and all I need to do is just practice Bhakti Yoga and forget everything else. It doesn't work that way. We have to see where this Bhakti piece fits into the larger picture. Or where Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga or Karma Yoga, how they all fit. Once we start practicing any one of these Yogas, in the beginning it might seem as if I am doing something a bhakti, 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 one person on the path of bhakti might think oh I am doing something different from these jnana people or these karma yogis etc. In the beginning for some time that might be inevitable but as we go deeper into the practice you will see that the walls that apparently seem to separate these yogas or the teaching that apparently gets separated in the different chapters of the Gita they all come together. So it's just that you are, it's like a circle that you are entering into but from different angles. So you are entering it from this kind of a bhakti segment or a jnana segment and different this thing. But ultimately we are all going to the same. So once you go inside all these divisions begin to melt. And so that's important to remember also. That was Swami Vivekananda once said that the secret 
of a harmonious development is that when you are doing something, you <coughs> should think that that practice alone will give me that ultimate freedom. Don't add that. So, for instance, so when you when you are doing meditation, when you are doing bhajan or singing, or when you are doing karma yoga, don't think of it as well. Oh, this is one part of my practice. Uh, this is one thing and then later on I'm doing now jnana and now I'm doing karma. No, it, it, that, that's not very helpful. That at that moment, when you're doing japa, at that moment you have to think, this practice alone can give me the highest. And when that ends and then you are now busy, say, doing karma yoga, then you say, this practice alone will give me the highest. So whatever I'm engaged in, my whole being must be filled into that. At that time I shouldn't mm, think of anything else. And Swami, Swamiji says that that is the secret of a harmonious development. So let's, let's take uh, the first four verses. So it begins, the twelfth chapter begins with Arjuna's question. Evam satata yuktaye bhaktam stvam paryupasate Tesham ke yoga then Krishna replies, Shri Bhagavan Vacha, Maya Vesha Mano Yemam, Nitya Yukta Upasati, Shraddhaya Parayopetas, Teme Yukta Tamamata, Yet Vaksharamanir Tesham Avyaktam Paryupasati, Sarvatram Sarvatragam Achintyancha, Utastam Achalam Bhuvam. San Niyamya Indriya Gramam Sarvatra Samabuddhayaha Te Prapnuvanti Mameva Sarvabhuta Gite Rathamaha And then the fifth verse Klesho Adhikataras Tesham Avyakta Sakta Chetasam Avyakta Hivatir Dukkham Dehavadhir Avapyate So very briefly to summarize what these five verses are saying is uh, Arjuna here is asking Krishna uh, which how should the divine be approached and there are there are different ways of uh, visualizing the divine in fact we will know from in Sri Ramakrishna's conversations that he was very fond of asking to sometimes when people came to him do you believe in God with form or without form in fact um, one of the disciples I'm not sure whether it's Swami I think one of <laughs> them, you know, they were all young men when they came to Ramakrishna. So, Sri Ramakrishna asked him, do you believe in God with form or without form? And he said, I'm not even sure whether God exists. So, <laughs> the question of with form or without form can come later on. But that, that was the different ways when we try to think of God. Uh, there are at least at least three broad ways we could say. One way is God with qualities. God who is kind, loving, God who protects me, God who takes care of me. And so that uh, Ishvara is called Saguna, Ishvara, God with qualities. Now, and sometimes uh, another way would be God not just with qualities but also form. So, Sakara. So with form and with qualities. So all the different devas and devis we have in the Hindu tradition, they have specific forms, Durga, Kali, Vishnu, Shiva, all of them have forms and then of course they are amazing. Sakala, Kalyana, Guda, Nilayaya, Ramanuja will say. All the auspicious quality, they are the abode, they are the treasury of all the auspicious qualities. So. So the deity can be, in, in Abrahamic traditions, God is with qualities. In fact, there is much thing about, no, there is no form. But God is still loving and kind and so on. Now in the Hindu tradition, all of these things exist. So there are, there are groups in the Hindu tradition who see only the, the Saguna Ishvara. Then there are others who say Saguna Sakara. And then there is the Nirakara, Nirguna Nirakara. So no qualities, beyond qual not no qualities, beyond qualities and, and beyond form. And so when Sri Ramakrishna said which of these you believe in, which are not to say that one of this is right or one of that is the other one is wrong. It's just that because we are different, 
uh, different ways of thinking will resonate with us. To someone, when they think of God, just this qualities might might seem to to resonate with them. But someone might seem with form, and, and some others with forms. Again, uh, what will resonate with whom? There is no objective way to know it, other than other than that, just the way we are different. And that's why the objects of our meditation also tend to be different. Therefore, it's the Guru then who decides for us that when, you, when I have to meditate, when I have to practice. There are so many options available, which is good. If it were just one, then it would be like, oh, it doesn't appeal to me now, no other choice. But if you have a lot of options, then there will be something among all this big variety which, which will kind of click inside. And so if, oftentimes we ourselves may not be very sure. And so it's the Guru then then says, for you, this is the ideal. This is the way of approaching the Divine that will help you most. So that's the way this discussion in, the, in chapter 12 begins. When Arjuna asks Krishna, so which, he says, um, the, the words he uses is, those devotees who, who ever steadfast thus worship thee, and those who also worship, those who worship the imperishable, the unmanifested, which of them are better versed in yoga? So very broadly, what, what Arjuna is asking is, who are better among these? Those who worship you with, like devotees, with, with devotion, with form and qualities, or others who want this formless, uh, little abstract, uh, more philosophical. So which of these are better? And then Krishna gives a, Krishna was probably the best diplomat ever born. <laughs> so, so Krishna said, of course, he said, yes, devotees, of course, they, they are good. And, and then these other people, they are good also. Mm -hmm. But then he says that the path, the path of those who try to follow this unmanifest, avyakta, kleshaha adhikaras tesham, their klesha, their, the pain is more. Now that might seem like Krishna is kind of biased in favor of with form and with qualities and he's kind of discouraging us from from this uh, avyakta. Um, and clearly that could be one interpretation of it. But it also is possible that what Krishna is pointing out that most of us are not fit for that that formless aspect of worship. Um, one of the difficulties we have uh, as human beings is that we are judgmental and we always want to say, well, which is better? This is better, this is good, this is right, this is wrong. Which is in itself not a bad bad quality. But, but because of that, um, oftentimes, um, uh, you know, the four yogas of Vivekananda. Why not just read all the four yogas? But there are oftentimes people say, well, which is the which is the easiest of these, or which one should I read first? Which one should I do second? And these are, I mean, legitimate questions. I remember years ago, I just newly joined the order then, sometime in the 70s, and uh, one of the first duties I had in the ashram was uh, selling books. We had a small book showroom and so that was my duty. And so this is one person came and so we have these two books published by Advirashama in Calcutta, Teachings of Swami Vivekananda and Teachings of Ramakrishna. Uh, medium sized books, not highly priced. And so there's this uh, one man came and along with his friend and they were debating uh, which of these two books to buy? And so they were, and this kind of a discussion going on among them. I'm just sitting here. I'm not saying anything. And uh, and so one of them said, "Let's let's read Vivekananda's teachings first. 
because if you don't understand the student, then what hope you have? <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one said, no, no, let's let's un- because what will the student say? The student say only what the teacher has taught. <laughs> so let's read that. And so they argued. They couldn't come to a point, and they asked me. And I said, buy both the books. <laughs> I wanted to sell more books. <laughs> so, and I just mentioned this to show that this kind of a thinking will automatically come with which is better, this first or that first. And so that's the reason when Arjuna is asking Krishna, well, which is better? Should I worship God as a devotee with a bhakta or go for this kind of a formless thing? And when Krishna says that the path of the formless is more difficult, what he's pointing out is that. And it seems as if that kind of a thinking may have existed during that time as well, because it certainly exists today. But somehow people think that jnana is somehow higher than bhakti, that um, philosophers, it's an abstract, formless. So we kind of put this ladder in one way, oh, God be form, formless is higher. Bhakti, dualism, qualified non-dualism, non-dualism. So we create this kind of a a hierarchy and then of course if jnana is higher, if formless is higher, then let me go to the formless. I am not, I am not an ordinary person, I know, I, why should I just go with form and this thing, let me go. Now that tendency, Krishna noticed it and he was, he was telling us, look deeply. Are you even fit to approach the divine as formless? So there are several points that, that need to be remembered here. You better keep on some clock or something. I want talking. Some. It's okay. It's okay. Huh? Yes. So I need to end. I need to stop sometime. No, just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. Yeah, because because I I think that I'm not sure if that's true with all swamis, but I think when you start speaking, you just you know, it's like one person who, uh, when when it's a political speech he was giving a talk and he went on speaking, speaking for a long time, and after some time realized really spoken for a long time, so he then apologized to the audience and said, "I'm sorry, he spoke for a long time." Uh, I didn't bring my watch. Mm-hmm. Then someone said, but there was a calendar in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is this idea. So that idea we have to give up. There is neither a jnani is higher than bhakta nor a bhakta is higher than jnani. <coughs> Swami Vivekananda in many different places emphasize that each is great in their own place. So it's not a competition, it's not a running race. Uh, we are not out to prove anybody wrong. We just have to see what works best for us. And each of these yogas, as Swami Vivekananda pointed out, uh, singly or in combination, uh, each of these yogas can take us to that highest truth. Now, why is the formless more difficult? Mm. One way of understanding this is that my okay, let's ask this question. Why is it that different people think of God in different ways? If God is just one, why God clearly loves us, then why don't we all think of God in the same way? Why God appears to us in different ways? And the reason is that I am trying to understand God through the lens of my own mind. And our minds are already colored. Our minds are colored by our own biases, our prejudices, our likes, our dislikes, um, the different various influences that we have had. And through that colored lens, I'm looking at that one infinite reality. And of course, um, it's appearing to me in one way, it's appearing to you in a different way because we are different. Now, growth or maturity or progress 
or evolution would mean that that lens of my mind will become clearer and clearer and then as by the lens will become clearer and clearer what I see will also change um, there is this book um, you remember the name of that author who wrote the evolution of God he's a professor in UPenn uh, Robert Wright maybe uh, I'm not sure. uh, it's a, there's a nice book called um, evolution of God written by a professor here in uh, UPenn it's a fascinating book if you have the patience it's a pretty thick book but if you have the patience and have interest you can read it it's actually I could say it's almost like a commentary but Swami Vivekananda has a talk in Jnana Yoga uh, where he discusses about uh, how God our idea of Robert, Robert Wright, Wright right? Yeah. Wright. So Robert Wright, right? <laughs> so how our idea of God or how we see God evolves as we evolve. And so I mean the title is a little provocative, evolution of God. It might seem as if God is evolving, but actually it's our perception of God is evolving. And that's the idea you find in a relatively condensed form in Vivekananda Dhyana Yoga lectures. And this book is kind of a, a more elaborate, it's a, it's a very academic work showing even this much boasted monotheism in, in, uh, in the West. Uh, it didn't start with monotheism. Uh, and it gives a, gives a specific reference you know, about how eventually how these many gods ultimately kind of coalesced and became one. Mm. It's a very, very uh, fascinating book. So, as long as we see, we each one of us, as long as I see myself as a person, I cannot but visualize God in personal terms. That is the bottom line. We might intellectually be able to appreciate a very transcendent, formless, eternal reality, but and beyond words, I mean, what does eternal mean anyway? What does formless mean anyway? You try to think of the eternal, the most we end up thinking is some kind of a vast expanse of the sky or an ocean. That's not eternal. And so we can talk about formlessness, we can talk about eternal stuff, we can use words like all pervading, but beyond words and some kind of a hazy idea, it just really means nothing and that is because because as long as I am a person my mind will always think in personal terms even when I try to think of God the source of this universe it will be personal my God will reflect my needs my aspirations my fears if there are seeds of anger and jealousy in me, my God will be an angry God, will be a jealous God. If, if my heart craves for love, I will tend to see God as a loving presence. So, while God may have made us in His or Her image, one thing is certain, we are creating God in our image. And as we change, as we evolve, the way we see God, the God in our own mental picture also changes. And that's the thing that Krishna is pointing out. That in order for me to appreciate the formless divine, I must first become a little bit of formless myself. In other words, the this clinging that I have to my own physical appearance and form the attachment I have to my own thoughts and ideas and emotions and feelings until that is loosened a little bit I will not be able to think of the divine as free from these qualities and form and that's okay I mean, it's not that but it's good to recognize that that how I see God is directly related to how I see myself and not just God how I see the world is directly related to how I see myself. So there is this anecdotal story in the Mahabharata. I'm not sure, I haven't read the whole Mahabharata myself. 
but uh, you know there is a lot of story which you can either point out to some particular verse or there are some story which is kind of part of the oral tradition but apparently uh, Krishna once gave these assignments to to Yudhishthira and to Duryodhana so he told Yudhishthira go and find out who is the worst person or most wicked human being in the world and he told Duryodhana go and find out who is the saintly person the who is completely good and they searched and searched everywhere and then finally comes and Yudhishthira tells Krishna I looked everywhere and everyone is good I didn't find any evil person and, and Duryodhana came and said look everywhere all are rogues <laughs> again we see outside what we are inside <coughs> also there is this one nice little story I read a few years ago mm, uh, so there are these two friends and they were walking in the Times Square in New York and so one of them was from the native Native uh, American tradition and so as these friends are walking in time and we you know from Times Square it's so much noise and crowd and sound it's, Swami Adishwaranandji who was in New York for many years he used to say Times Square is Mahamaya's headquarters <laughs> <laughs> so so these two friends they are walking there and then suddenly this uh, this Native American friend tells the other one I'm hearing the sound of, you know cricket those small uh, insects I'm hearing the sound of cricket and um, don't think about the Indian cricket this because that is just the cricket World Cup just got uh, finished yeah. so so he said I'm hearing the sound of cricket and so this his friend says what I'm just hearing the sound of all this traffic and everything and he said no, I'm hearing so then they just look around and they kind of go to the side street and the back street they find under one dumpster they end up from one cricket mother and they're making that sound and his friend is amazed oh my god how could you hear that sound of the cricket and so this the other friend didn't didn't uh, didn't say anything he just said okay i'll tell you so they came back onto the main street and were walking then after a few minutes this native uh, American friend from his pocket he took a few quarters in his hand and just kind of dropped them on the sidewalk immediately all these people who are walking everyone is in a rush as soon as they heard the sound of it everyone was like what are you going to do? <coughs> and that sound wasn't any great either and so then this friend tells the other you know we all find what we are looking for <laughs> so what where our sensitivity lies what we are looking for we will find and that's very important for devotees if we are looking for truth if we are looking for understanding if we are looking for goodness there is plenty of it in the world around us there may be a lot within our own family among our friends if we are only looking for it but if I'm just my mind is looking for mistakes and how terrible everybody is, how every, everything is very corrupt that's what I'm going to see everywhere yeah. so that's it's very important to remember what we are what we find is what we are looking for and also a very helpful spiritual practice is to always make an effort to see goodness everywhere now yes, I, I understand all the argument about yeah, we must be realistic and there are terrible people and there is evil in the world. Yes, I completely agree with it. Nevertheless, <coughs> if we consciously develop the habit of trying to see goodness, that's very helpful spiritually. Mm -hmm. Even in someone, you know, people whom you like and love, it's very easy to find goodness there. But, but a part would be even people whom you don't particularly like even people who irritate the hell out of you <coughs> just, just pause a little bit before getting too much upset and look and it's possible that in, in this a whole mass of irrit irritability uh, you might find there may be something good there some tiny little good and if you kind of look at that goodness your own irritation will become less so by looking goodness outside 
we are not doing any benefiting anybody else so you can even if you don't want to benefit anybody you are really only benefiting yourself so purely from a utilitarian standpoint it's also very helpful to just try to see goodness and of course <coughs> be aware that there is at this relative level there is evil there is exploitation and we have to protect ourselves and uh, that's true but that doesn't prevent ours us from trying to see goodness everywhere and so that's the background we need to keep in mind when krishna is saying oh for this formless one it's very difficult he's saying difficult because those <coughs> such people are very few that's why when narendra nath vivekananda as a young man when he first went to ramakrishna sri ramakrishna was happy of course but he was also as much as it possible for an avatar who sees past present and future but at the human level he was he said he was quite surprised that uh, calcutta was a british capital of those days and a steep in very worldliness and then here is this young man who comes and ramakrishna sees that one he is pure to the core and he said how could from such a materialistic worldly city this pure soul could come I know I forgot now why I mentioned this. Um, what was I talking Seeing about? Seeing the good everywhere. Seeing the yeah. good. Duryodhana and him, they look, whatever inside comes out, what do you have? There's a forms and formless. Okay, all these suggestions are helpful. <laughs> <laughs> It's a beautiful story. Yes, yes. Mm. Now I got it. Yeah, good. Thank you for that. Um, So Sri Ramakrishna was so happy and surprised that here such a pure soul has come that at the very first meeting he wanted to give him a taste of that formless mm-hmm. and you know he just touches him and this Narendra who was barely 18 or 19 years old the whole things are melting all forms go and he just shouts what are you doing to me am i baba ma chen badi the you know i got my parents at home and he just shouted and then ramakrishna says okay 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 and he says in due course so even such a pure soul who came at that moment mm-hmm. ramakrishna found he was not ready for that highest he, he even then now to think that vivekananda <coughs> he wasn't ready for any of us to then say well i don't care for all the dualistic thing on this for highest non is just nonsense so that's the idea why he is saying that it's very painful etc so it is not to say that somehow that is not good or that is worse or this is somehow better so krishna is not creating a hierarchy of things here all that is pointing out is most of us uh, have to begin where we are and then take a step a step a step and as they say you know there's a chinese proverb which says the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step so uh we just have to take the first step and then the next step and the next step and so we can begin as beginners but we don't have to stay forever as beginners the more we practice our path the way we have been taught by our teachers the more we do it with faith with regularity with sincerity with devotion we will make progress and a time will come we might be fit for these higher ideals so as we evolve our ideals will evolve so i will i will stop here now um, with just this kind of an introductory thing with these first five or six verses and then most of this chapter which we will see tomorrow um, krishna will discuss about who is the ideal devotee and uh, a number of qualities will get described the number of traits will get described and what krishna is essentially saying is if i want to become a real bhakta a true bhakta these are the kind of qualities i need to cultivate in my own life and so that we will discuss when we meet tomorrow so we we have a few minutes if you have any any comments or questions or thoughts or ideas feel free to ask yeah. if you don't ask question i'm going to ask you so <laughs> you choose whether you want to answer my questions or ask me questions So uh
Thank you so much for this. Uh, um, I was thinking about what you said earlier that uh, to really be free from suffering, we have to stop being human. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I, I talk with my students, I, I will uh, ask them about what are the what are the top causes of death. Mm -hmm. So people talk about accidents, heart attack, and mm -hmm. so on. And I say yes, but these are all survivable. People have these and survive. Is there something that you that is hundred percent fatal? Mm -hmm. And the answer is birth. <laughs> so the yeah. only way to avoid death is to not be born. Absolutely, right? really, the only way to not suffer is to not be it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, what happens is sometimes, it's a very good point, the sometimes moksha as an ideal is not that attractive. I mean, if you say, oh, you go to heaven and be in the presence of the Lord, well, that seems like, oh, that's something, because that's what we can relate to now. If I meet someone I like and love, and if I'm in their presence, I feel happy. So I want to be in the presence of God. But moksha, and especially when moksha is described as, you'll never be born again. Oh, never born. Where will I go? <laughs> it's 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 ter I mean it's terrifying. Not be born again. On the other hand, if you say you will not die again, right. that sounds wonderful. <laughs> but actually, the same thing. <laughs> so it just it's just how you express it that makes all the difference. And so uh, a story that's told about this is a uh, one uh, writer who went uh, who wrote a travelogue. He went and spent a week in Paris and wrote about his experiences there. It was a very well written book and uh, it was published uh, seven days in Paris and total failure. We just The books wouldn't move and, and the publishers were disappointed and the uh, author is disappointed that he took so much pain to write and uh, nothing happened. And then someone got a brilliant idea. So they said, okay, let's recall the copies and then they changed the cover, changed the title and 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 again brought it out to the market and the book became a bestseller nothing was changed not a word was changed what was changed was just the title from seven days in paris they changed to seven nights in paris <laughs> and became a bestseller but of course if you spend seven days in paris you have spent seven nights in paris so it's like this so if you say you will never die again then it's very attractive you're never born again it doesn't doesn't sound <laughs> <laughs> Guruji, I have a question about um, our Ishtadipta, you know, uh, uh, how does that manifest itself, meaning how do we choose or is it our evolution that makes, you know, that Ishtadipta be our, um, the person that we feel the closest to how how does that dynamic work? Okay, I don't think that. there is any logic behind it. Okay. It just okay. It's it's something just clicks and there is no way to logically describe that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Pranam. Um this is a more of a theoretical question. So mm, on the three Abrahamic religions, like you mentioned, um, they typically have God without form, but with qualities. God with loves qualities, it. yeah. Yeah. So it is uh, what we will call saguna, nirakara. Okay. And then whatever happens, they are also human beings. So there are billions of people of different kinds. And Sri Ramakrishna says. Uh, God will definitely, if you are willing, if you are eager, then God will somehow solve your problem. If you want to go to Kashi, somebody will show you up. So for those people, what about their other wishes, like trying to see the God as a human being, which is our wish also, and how to see, for some of us more qualified perhaps, God, will, God, God will appear to us in a way we want God to appear. So they will, since they are trained from their childhood to only think of God as formless and uh, with good qualities, they will never experience this our other menu options. What do you mean our? Our means Hindus. No, no, they just, uh, all, none of these are Hindu or anything. These are just different ways of thinking of God. All right. 
So it's not a Hindu way of thinking of God, no? But I would say that uh, people like us won't be worried. Like you read just now, uh, Krishna would say, Yay, go ahead, this is good, this is cool, do this. No, but it's not, it's not even why, why do we think that it's necessary to see God in all these three different ways? No, I, I don't think so, but we have the choices. As our I, I actually don't even agree with that. I don't okay. think we have a choice. No one really chooses. I'm going to choose God with form. All right then. Okay. It just happens. So, uh, so you are not saying that, but somehow when I was born with whatever karma etc. in my language, uh, I was somehow destined to fall into one or the other. Although, what's your point? The point is that I was not born a Christian. Hmm. And if I had been born a Christian, I would have. Again, again, I don't think I don't think it's a question of being born a Christian or a Hindu, because it's not as if if I'm a, if I'm a Hindu, I'm automatically going to think in a Hindu sort of way. It doesn't make difference. All right. Yeah. I have to. I have again, to, I just think about. I have to take a couple of three words to check it out. No, it's like it's <laughs> like this. It's it's as human beings, we have a mind, and minds are different. And irrespective of which family I am born in, or which part of the world, or which part in which point in history, there are certain things will appeal to me in a certain way, and that's how it. I mean, these are kind of very. Even when I said, oh, in the Abrahamic traditions or in the Hindu tradition, these are very broad stroke generalizations. It's not as if all Hindus think in the same way, or all everybody, all Muslims think in some way. It's not like that. There are infinite variations within these. As a follow-up of hmm. the same thought, hmm. I'm born in Hindu household, hmm. but as I was growing up, hmm. somehow Buddhism, and there was no internet back then, hmm. but there were a lot of books of Buddhism around, hmm. right? somehow I got drawn to that, hmm. but then got married into Jen, but then started to find answer hmm. into more Vedantic thinking. Hmm. Uh, and then got back to Bhagavad Gita, which I first read when I was eight year old. And this whole journey um, from one point to other in different direction, what 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 takes you through? through? What does it matter? As long as you Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't, but sometimes you question, question your own thinking at that point. You're thinking, are you confused? And maybe I am confused. Oh, well, why should you be confused? It's like we have to be clear about what you are seeking in life. If what you want in life is truth, understanding of whatever, <coughs> wherever that is available to you, you should feel today. So you have a certain idea and a light towards that idea can come to you often in most unexpected ways, in unexpected forms. So, so long as your own ideal and purpose is at least relatively clear in the head, there is no reason to be confused about it, I think. Yeah. Alright, so we will continue this uh, tomorrow. Then we have any announcements to do.